radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is the Yaron Brook Show. All right, everybody, welcome to the Yaron Brook Show on this uh Thursday, oh, no, it's Saturday. What, where did Thursday come from? I don't know. Saturday, April 6th, I am in Buenos Aires, Argentina, coming to you from my hotel room. I, I just came back from the conference, um, uh, the, uh, the Ayn Rand Latin America uh, uh, conference. Uh, Millet uh, just did an interview uh, to end the conference, to end the day, not the conference. The conference continues tomorrow, but to end the day. Uh, and I got a chance to meet him, and I got a chance to hand him my, bo uh, my book with Don Watkins. Uh, so I thought I'd jump on. I don't have a lot of time. Uh, I've got a, a, there's a kind of a formal dinner associated with the conference. In, uh, in 45 minutes, I figured I'd jump on for about half an hour, and then uh, I need to catch an Uber to get to, uh, to, get to the dinner. Uh, but just give you my impressions of the day of the conference and then of uh, Millet himself. I, let me just say, I, I thought the conference was, uh, the conference so far has been really, really good. Uh, it's, um, uh, I have to say, I think I gave a really good talk uh, on, uh, on freedom, uh, what it is, and uh, how our conception, not just of freedom, but of life, and uh, is uh, the conception of objectivism, is so different than that of libertarians and of conservatives. So, a big part of what I did was to differentiate um, objectivism from, uh, from libertarianism and, and, and conservatism, and I thought that went, uh, that went really well. I, I was really happy with, uh, with the way it went. And uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, I did that this morning. Actually, somebody came up to me just as I was leaving this evening, and uh, I, I, like five, six students were standing around, and they said, uh, your talk was by far the best talk of the conference. It was even better than Millet, if we can, if we're allowed to say so. And yeah, I mean, it was better than Millet's. Uh, so um, it left an impression. Uh, hopefully, uh, that means uh, some additional subscribers to the Iran Book Show. We'll see. These are people. These are kids, uh, students who did not know uh, that we had. I had a show. So um, yeah, it's great. So it, being here, doing this is exactly achieving what I wanted, which is to expose the ideas of Ayn Rand, to expose the Iran Book Show, me, uh, but Ayn Rand, more importantly, to uh, people who are not familiar. And uh, that's definitely achieving uh, the purpose. Uh, I thought uh, Ben Baer gave a, a good talk on, on capitalism. Uh, Augustina gave a good talk on collectivism versus individualism, although it was a Spanish, so... I, I, I didn't get to follow the whole talk. Um, and what else did we have? Tal Tzfani gave a talk on, uh, in a sense, the role of the mind in, um, uh, as the mode of the world. Uh, Maria Marti gave a talk. So yeah, I thought, I thought the first day of the conference was quite good. And, uh, and a lot of people, uh, you know, I think, um, I mean, the room was only packed packed, solid for Millet, which means probably over 400 people were there for Millet. But I'd say there were two to 300 people there most of the day. Uh, so I uh, certainly think for my talk, which is the first one in the morning, there were probably 200 plus, maybe uh, 300, I don't know, 250 maybe, uh, people in the audience. So, so that was uh, terrific and, and a great success. I, I did get to... Uh, uh, meet Millet, so uh, he had approved a, a, a small list of people who could meet him basically uh, before he went into the green room, got some photos with him, um, and uh, so that was, um, uh, you know, that was, uh, that was kind of fun. Uh, so it was basically me and Tauts Fani, the CEO of the Ayn Institute, and then uh, a, a few other people, including uh, somebody is going to be speaking tomorrow about his experiences escaping from Cuba. This is the guy who flew a MiG-27 out of Cuba <laughs> to the United States and defected a real hero, and then went back to get his family. Um, so a real hero. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing his presentation, although, again, it'll be in Spanish, so I'll have to, I'll have to wear my, my, uh, my translation headphones uh, to understand it. But um, uh, so, you know, Mila was there. Uh, 
I was surprised he's, he's, he's a little taller than I thought he was. I, he comes across, I thought he was short, so he's not. Um, uh, he, 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 friendly, but um, I don't know, he seems shy. <laughs> Uh, he seems a little reserved and shy. Uh, he, 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 no real reaction, and we'll get to this about the interview, no real reaction to the fact that we're from the Ayn Rand Institute, no real response about Ayn Rand. Uh, I know that Tal gave him a copy of Opa uh, by Leonard Peikoff, uh, and then I handed him, which he looked at and kind of no real response, and then I handed him Free Market Revolution, and... Uh, and, he, and he said, oh, and, and, you know, I said, I, you know, I wrote this with Don Watkins. And uh, the title, Free Market Revolution, I thought it would be particularly appropriate for you, given what you're trying to do in, in Argentina. And he, he, he smiled. He was the first time I'd seen him really beaming and uh, uh, really happy. And he said, uh, he said, I'll definitely read this. I'll read this. So who knows? Who knows, uh, but it would be great if he read it. Um, I'll say that I, he definitely needs it. He definitely needs it. Uh, uh, you know, he's, he's, a, he's an economist who maybe understands certain of the economic principles around capitalism, but he really, 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 really needs, needs, needs to understand the moral issues surrounding capitalism and that he's going to get from Ayn Rand and, uh, and, and I think he'll get some of that from, uh, from uh, Free Market Revolution. Uh, it, it, it's geared at that level. It's geared to the person interested in economic liberty. So I'm hoping that it's, it's a way in. Um, everybody says he's read Atlas Shrugged. I see no evidence of that. Everybody says he's read Ayn Rand. He mentioned it. I see no evidence of that, I have to say. Um, in the interview, so he did an interview. So that was a fairly quick. We got some photos. Um, I, I handed him the book. Uh, more photos. That's the only real exchange we had was around the book, which he got. He seemed to get excited about. Um, and then he went on stage and and he did this interview with uh, Maria Marti, who runs uh, Ayn Rand Center Latin America, and. I mean, the interview, I thought, you know, was very much him being a politician, but being a politician, it's pro, relatively pro-freedom. But, um, uh, you know, his, 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 his first answer to the first question lasted 30 minutes. <laughs> that was the interview, basically, and then a few other short, short questions and answers, uh, in which he basically gave a story of his campaign and his rise to, from, from, uh, from an economist to a politician to ultimately running for president and the rallies he had and, and the, 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 how, he, how he spread ideas. I thought that was the most interesting part of the interview probably was the part where he said that um, uh, how he thought he influenced young people by, by citing books and by giving them references and by encouraging them to read. And the books he cited were all the, the economics books. I mean, um, uh, I'd say the, the, the so uh, so he gave a, a story about that. Uh, you know, the the one I'd say the most disappointing of his answers was the answer when asked about his view of businessmen as heroes, which which he's, he stated often. But he views businessmen as heroes because they're benefactors of mankind, because they're benefactors of society. There was no hint of the idea of pursuing their own values, using their mind, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, thriving, flourishing, individuals flourishing, kind of a, a self-interested perspective on, um, on uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 the businessman and the morality of the businessman, which, if you read Ayn Rand, he, 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 you know, he, he would have at least read whether, again, whether he remembers it, understood it, accepted it, uh, you know, so... I, and he never mentioned Ayn Rand during the interview, and he was, uh, he was um, given a, a, a gift uh, by a uh, Guatemalan sculptor, my, my, um, uh, my favorite active, active uh, uh, selling sculptor in the world, a guy named uh, Walt, uh, Walter Peter, who, um, who uh, is Guatemalan, and he's got this beautiful sculpture of Atlas, Atlas holding the world with one hand kind of easily. 
And it, I think it's a beautiful sculpture, and, and uh, that was given to him, and the reference was made to Atlas Shrugged, and the reference was made to Ayn Rand. And even then, he didn't bite, right? He just didn't say anything about Ayn Rand, which makes me think that he might not have read her, or he doesn't like her, or he doesn't read her but doesn't really know anything about it and, and doesn't want to talk about it, or that it's, it's politically dangerous for us to talk about it, which is possible. It's possible that he gets it, that he ended I mean, some people would argue he gets it. it he gets egoism. He gets the, the self-interested motivation of businessmen. He gets that that's the moral foundation. He just can't say it because it's politically unacceptable and he would lose an election. I, I, I mean, that's possible. I, I, I can't say that that is not true. I just don't know. I see no evidence one way or the other. Um, as I suspected... I know a number of people here in Argentina who know him quite well. Um, so, and they think, so, so I talked to one of them after the talk, um, and, and, and they think that uh, he is, um, this could really open doors and he would maybe be in, open to, interested in having a real conversation about these things. And if, if he was, I, I'd be willing to fly down to Argentina and have that conversation with him or maybe somebody else, but uh, that would be great. If this opened the door and maybe he reads the book and he's curious and he wants to talk more about it, that would be super exciting. Uh, other than that, I think his presence at the conference mainly uh, drew people in and, and uh, they were exposed to a lot of ideas. One of the things we did at the conference purposefully was because there are fundamental issues we disagree with me, Leon, abortion, uh, uh, anarchy, uh, individualism, right, uh, and, and, and the moral defense of, a proper moral defense of capitalism, is we structured the program of the conference to deal with those issues. So I dealt with the differences between objectivism and libertarianism. Tomorrow, I am doing a debate with an uh, anarchist. So uh, I'll present the anti-anarchist argument. Um, ben Baer tomorrow will be giving a talk on abortion and why abortion is a moral right. Um, uh, you know, Augustina talked about individualism uh, and as, as the alternative to collectivism because he, he, he goes after collectivism, but he never really articulates alternative, which is individualism, and never really plays it out. Again, maybe that's because, maybe that's because, um, uh, you know, he's, um, uh, because, again, he needs to get elected. I don't know. Uh, and then, and then uh, we're doing, and then of course uh, Ben did today a uh, talk about the morality of capitalism, which presents objectivists. So we've we've structured the program of the conference in hope that a lot of his fans would come to the actual conference and hear our objections, our uh, our critique, our positions he holds, and hopefully open their eyes, hopefully intrigue them, uh, interest them, fascinate them. Uh, and, and, oops, one second, one second, the, uh, the plug came out of the wall, uh, and hopefully intrigue them and fascinate them about Ayn Rand, and that's the goal. The goal is to get people to read Ayn Rand, the goal is to get people to engage in Ayn Rand's ideas, uh, and, uh, so, uh, both, uh, both today and tomorrow, we are doing a whole series of talks, basically presenting the alternative ideas to Millet's ideas, not because he will hear them, because he won't, but because uh, hopefully some of the people, uh, will, because the people at the conference will hear them, and they'll, they'll understand no opposition. And, um, um, right. Uh, so... Uh, all right, so let's, let, I don't have a lot of time, so let me take some of these questions, uh, particularly, uh, particularly uh, okay, so we got uh, Q2 Santos says, you criticize me late saying that entrepreneurs are social benefactors. You said Steve Jobs helped millions. How is it different than what Millet said? Praising them for their contribution to humanity does not equate to praising altruism. Friendly fire. I agree. I, I didn't say he was an altruist. I did say that if that's all you say about it, it appears it's a collectivistic defense. It's not, it, 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 and it implies altruism. They're doing it for humanity. They are, um, uh, you know, the, the reason it's moral is because a lot of people were helped. Now, it's absolutely true and needs to be said 
that the only way they are successful and they get rich is because they make the world a better place. They improve the lives of other people. They, they, they help millions, billions, actually. But if that's all you say, then I think it's wrong. And I try, maybe you can catch me, I try not, that that is not all I say. I talk about the fact that Bill Gates goes to work. Why? To make money. And that's a good thing. And why does he go to work? Because he loves it. Because it's a manifestation of his individual flourishing. It's a manifestation. His work is his passion. His work is his central purpose in life. He is a valuer. He is creating a flourishing life for himself. That's the primary moral defense of Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, and entrepreneurs and billionaires. And the only way they do that because of the trader principle, because of trade, is by improving the lives of other people. I mean, Ayn Rand wrote Atlas Shrugged and improved my life and improved all of your lives. But she didn't write it to improve our lives. She wrote it because she loved writing. She wrote it because this was her passion. She wrote it because it was an expression of her values. She wrote it because it was part of her pursuit of her happiness in her flourishing as an individual. And yes, when you do that, this is the beauty, you know, this is the reality of, of, of a self-interested and a self-interested world is if you pursue your self-interest in a productive way, and given that a productive way means that you are a trader, then you will benefit other people. But the purpose is not to benefit other people. And the fact that you benefit other people is not what gives it a moral, you know, a, a stamp of morality. The fact that you're improving your life, that you're making your life better, that's what makes it an improvement. And by the way, in my morality, uh, morality talk about capitalism, I present the fact that Bill Gates helped billions of people, not as his, the moral justification for Bill Gates, but to expose altruism for what it really is, to show that real altruism is not about helping other people, that really what altruism demands, because they hate Bill Gates in spite of him helping other people, real altruism is about the sacrifice and the destruction and the, 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 the non-producing, the, the destruction of his own, um, uh, uh, his own um, uh, destruction of his own uh, values. That's when you're really a good guy, right? So, real, so altruism really is not about helping other people. Altruism is really about self-sacrifice. So, uh, you know, Millet is not about self-sacrifice. But for somebody who criticizes collectivism, to say that businessmen are hero because they benefit society is about as collectivistic as an argument as it gets. And that's a reality. And it opens a door, opens up the door to the assumption that businessmen are altruists, which they are not. And that altruism is the only way to morally defend somebody. So that's the challenge I have. Um, and, and yes, I, I think it's very, very, very important, and Ayn Rand does this a lot, to say that businessmen benefit millions of individuals, billions of individuals. But you can't stop there. You have to say more. And you have to say that it's in the service of their own happiness that they do it. It's in the service of their own values that they do it. That's not the primary. And for Millet, that, that's it. That's, that, that, you know, that he stops there, which is unfortunate. Because, again, I don't know if he knows the rest of the argument or that he can't say the rest of the argument for political reasons. But that's not a good impression that he's giving uh, you know, so many people. Look, I, I am, um, uh, you know, I'm excited about Millet. In spite of my reservations, I'm excited about Millet. I, you know, I'm, I'm excited about anybody who's going to move a, a country, in this case Argentina, towards greater freedom. I'm excited about anybody who's willing to go up there and criticize collectivism. It's, it's, I'd, like, I'd like the criticism to be more devastating. 
uh, in the sense that you have to offer an alternative. And, and that alternative is individualism, which means self-interest, which means everything that I've talked about, right? Um, I, so I'm a fan, I, you know, and, and I, only want, I only want him to be successful. And I really, really, really want him to grow philosophically, to just to grow. I mean, one of the things that I noticed in, his, in the Q&A is he's not philosophical. He's an economist. He knows economics, and he keeps reverting to economics. He did, he did um, uh, mention my favorite living economist, so that's good, uh, who I think is very, very good. And very individualistic and 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 very important, uh, uh, you know. Uh, and that is uh, Israel Kutzner. Israel Kutzner, who who taught for many years at NYU. I think Israel Kutzner is probably 95, 96, So I don't think he teaches anymore. I think he's still alive. Anyway, uh, I mean, he's my favorite living economist and one of my favorite economists of all time. He did mention uh, Israel Kutzner, and uh, and that was terrific. Uh, and he mentioned him in I think a positive, a good context. Uh, so that was good. Uh, what else? Um, I mean, the audience went wild. So, uh, I, I mean, this is really, uh, he is a kind of, he, he's very charismatic. He's, he's very technical and kind of boring, but he's very charismatic at the same time. And uh, the audience went wild uh, when he was introduced in the beginning. They went wild at the end. They yelled, you know, go freedom, whatever. It was quite, uh, it was quite um, exciting. The name of the economist is Israel Kutzner. He's an Austrian economist um, in the Mises line, and he specialized particularly in writing about the entrepreneur, the importance of entrepreneur, the centrality of the entrepreneur to, uh, to economics, to, to uh, 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 economic success. All right, let's see. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Jonathan says, congratulations. Uh, congrats. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm not sure there's anything to congratulate, but yes. Uh, Batista says, uh, hi, Yuan. I was sitting behind you at the first half of the event. So happy to meet you. Uh, you talk, your talk was great. Hope to exchange a few more words tomorrow. Absolutely. I'll be around all day tomorrow, and I will be uh, in the anarchism debate. I know a lot of people in the audience uh, were anarchists and are looking forward uh, to that debate. Ayn Mekat says, this conflict is slowly turning me into the joker. Gaza must be destroyed. Um, don't become the Joker, please. That, that's awful. Joker is pure nihilism. Um, but, the, but the Gaza conflict is horrible. But anyway, that's not what we're talking about today. Andrew says, a selfish brute is a contradiction in terms. Absolutely. Andrew then says, do you view the Democrats turning against Israel as causing a schism on the left? Or is the average Jewish Democrat turning against Israel too? I do think at some extent it's, it's, turning a, it, it's creating a schism on the left. But the reality is that the longer this conflict lasts, the longer Israel takes to do what is necessary, the longer it takes to win this and to, to destroy Hamas, the more opportunities there are for it to make mistakes, to it to stimulate, stimulate uh, the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the altruism and the, uh, the, the weakness of, of many American Jews and the more they are likely to turn against Israel. So I do think that, uh, that uh, you know, Jews will also ultimately, potentially, turn against Israel, particularly given that Israel is led by Netanyahu, which gives them an excuse to hate, to hate him, uh, an excuse to hate Israel because they hate Netanyahu. So uh, it would be much better for Israel if they were led right now by somebody else. Uh, uh, Yair Lapid, who is a leftist center guy, or really a centrist, He's not leftist, and he's really a centrist. Would probably do exactly the same thing as Netanyahu, but people wouldn't hate him because he's not Netanyahu. So, I, and, and he would probably uh, find ways to be less obnoxious than Netanyahu uh, it tends to be. Uh, Netanyahu's acting in Gaza weak, but he gives, a, as usual, he gives a strong speech. They're still not in Rafah. Two months after they were supposed to be in, they were supposed to invade Rafah at the beginning of the Ramadan. It's almost the end of the Ramadan. Ramadan's about a month. They haven't done anything. They're not close to it. They haven't presented a plan. They haven't evacuated civilians. It's just very, very, very discouraging what's going on. But anyway, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's uh, uh, you know, uh, we'll talk about that another time. Maximum, Maximix says, go over your analysis post-Brian Kaplan debate. 
you mentioned good points that you forgot. You asking me now? God, you should have asked me right after the debate. I don't remember what the good points that I didn't mention. I mean, in a debate, particularly the debate tomorrow is, is quite short. I think opening statements are five minutes. So there's not a lot to say. Not a lot, going to be a lot of opportunity to say much. But um, I don't remember what the points uh, in the Brian Kaplan debate that I, that I forgot. But yes, there, there are always going to be good points that you don't express because um, debates go very fast. You have very short periods of time to talk about stuff. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, have no, I can't remember. I, I thought the debate with Brian was good. I, I thought I won the debate. I did win it in terms of the voting, uh, the number of people who changed their minds. Uh, could have done better, I'm sure. Um, are there things I forgot that would uh, have been uh, powerful? Yes. But the best thing about anarchism you can do right now is go read uh, my essay with Don Watkins about, uh, you know, why government is a necessary good, why anarchy is wrong. You can find that on Don Watkins' substack. Just do, you know, I think, I think if you do anarchy, you're on book, anarchy, you're on Watkins. Um, yeah, there it is. So just do um, Anarchy, you're on Brook, Don Watkins, and you'll find it. It's called, and it's also on Brian Kaplan's website. It's called Anti State is Anti Freedom. And uh, so you can find it both on Don Watkins' uh, Substack and on, uh, and on Brian Kaplan's Substack. You'll find, uh, you'll find both. Don Watkins' Substack is called Earthly Idealism. So uh, Earthly Idealism, one word, dot com. You'll find it, and, and the uh, anti-state and anti-freedom is right there, so you can find it. Uh, so I, I think reading that is much better than, than following a debate. Emil says, have you seen the libertarian classical liberal party on the rise in Denmark, and do you think this is a step towards major change in Scandinavia? I mean, uh, you know, Denmark has, uh, has, has always had a significant presence of kind of classical liberals, in it, uh, a friend of mine and, and, a, and a, a supporter of the Ayn Rand Institute, Lars Christensen, the Danish um, entrepreneur, businessman, uh, uh, was uh, ran his own party that was supposed to be classical liberal, and it got into parliament. It was quite successful, but then the party itself, I think, got corrupted by statism, which all, all, often happens in these um, uh, often happens in these uh, kind of political situations. Uh, so I think there's, there's, there's always a chance in Denmark. Uh, I think Norway has flirted with kind of classical liberal politics, but as soon as they get into power, the classical liberal ideas somehow go out the window and they, and they become status like everybody else. I, I, I don't know if, if we're going to see a major change. I mean, Scandinavia is worrisome. In Sweden, there's a major rise in, in status. Uh, right-wing kind of nationalist tendencies, anti-immigrant, um, and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, in the context of Sweden, you could argue there's some justification, but again, you have to provide the right context for it. Uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, so Sweden is probably heading into, and, and then Finland also has this very nationalistic uh, right-wing political party that is gaining ground. I don't see... Uh, a, 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 and maybe some of the Swedes and the Finns can correct me, but I really don't see a classical liberal tendency in Sweden and Finland. Norway always flirts with it, but Norway's a rich country because of oil. There, there's no urgency in Norway for anything. Uh, they're generally centrist. They're not socialist. They're, they're not capitalist. They're generally centrist, and I think they'll probably stick with that. Uh, and then, so I think Denmark is interesting. Like, look, I've given tons of talks in Denmark. I mean, for 20 years now, uh, over 20 years, I've been going to Denmark regularly. I used to go teach seminars at Saxo Bank uh, to uh, Danish bankers. Uh, I've, I've, given, uh, I've given talks at CIPOS. I've given talks at the, at the university in Denmark. I think Denmark is very, a very exciting place. I've given talks, I think, to one of the political parties that was more classical liberal. So I think we've had an influence there. I, you know, Atlas Shrugged, was translated into Danish by, uh, you know, funded by Lars, and it, it sold quite well. Lars Christian himself has been on television a lot, kind of push, uh, kind of advertising Atlas Shrugged and ideas of Atlas Shrugged. So there, I mean, Denmark's a small country, 
And there's been a concerted, significant effort to get Atlas Shrugged and the ideas of classical liberalism exposure in, uh, you know, in Denmark, in Copenhagen, in Denmark more broadly. So, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think that there's a good chance that some of those ideas are sticking. And maybe Denmark is a place where, where there'll be a major step towards change. I'm less optimistic about the other countries in what we call Scandinavia, right? So uh, I think Denmark is, I mean, I'm glad to see that there is a classical liberal party that is on the rise. I, I haven't seen that yet. I haven't, uh, you know, I, I haven't experienced that yet. All right, Oivit says, uh, nice to see you so fired up, Iran, mainly because I'm talking fast because I have to go. So uh, I'm trying to get a lot out quickly. Uh, Apollo Zeus, thanks for the support. Really appreciate it. We got a bunch of stickers. Uh, let's go. Uh, Zach, thank you. John, as, as always, thank you. Gail, thank you. Stephen Hopper, thank you. Uh, Eric, thank you. Mary Aline, thank you all. All of you, uh, long time and consistent supporters of the Iran Book Show. Stephen, uh, Stephen, thank you. Um, Wes, $100, really, really appreciate it. Uh, John, thank you, and uh, yeah, that's all the stickers. We have one final question. I really have to go. I'm supposed to be at this dinner. Andrew says, what do you think of Israel's communication strategy? You read the bombing of the ad. Aid workers, they claim full responsibility, apologized, and said they're accepting responsibility in difference between Israel and Hamas. So first, I think, yeah, I mean, I think the fact that they took responsibility is right. They're not lying. They're not pretending. They're not evading reality. They, they did it. It was an accident, and I think they should call it such. They could talk about the accident, and it was a, they didn't mean to do it. I think that's important. Um, but I think they also need to make the claim. Anybody dies in Gaza in this war is the moral responsibility of Hamas. Everybody, no matter who pulls the trigger, is the moral responsibility of Hamas. That message needs to be loud and clear, and that is not coming through. That is not something they're talking about uh, because, in a sense, they've, they've, they've accepted the world's, you know, altruistic framing of all of this. I Israel, uh, I I you know, the world is just looking for uh, opportunities uh, to slam Israel. Uh, and unfortunately, Israel's giving them uh, those opportunities. All right. Uh, thank you, guys. I, I appreciate your support for a very quick, very short show. Uh, I will have more to say about the conference, I'm sure, in the days to come. I'm looking forward to the talks tomorrow, to my debate on anarchism. I, I'm particularly curious about Ben's um, talk about abortion and how the audience will respond to it. Remember, Argentina is still a Catholic country. And, uh, you know, so it should be, it should continue, the conference should continue to be uh, exciting and interesting, and uh, you know, I hope Millet reads my book. Uh, I hope it has an impact, and I hope uh, you know. Uh, uh, one day, I get a phone call inviting me to come to Argentina to have uh, coffee and a conversation uh, with Millet about how to bring about a real, unapologetic, unequivocal free market revolution and a revolution in individual rights uh, without any compromise and without any, um, any moral uh, questions. I've had a nice Argentinian steak. Uh, I've eaten well in Argentina, but I, you know, this is a, I don't know, some formal event. I didn't bring a tie, so they're going to have to accept me without a tie. But uh, it's some formal event at some palace, a dinner. I'm sure there'll be steak there. But I think I had steak for lunch. I think in Argentina, you kind of have steak for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Maybe I'm on a, on a Jordan Peterson carnival diet or something. I'm not sure. All right, everybody. I will see you all maybe tomorrow. I'll try to do a show tomorrow. But if not, then certainly uh, Monday, I'll do a show from Santiago, Chile. And the rest of the week, we'll try to fit in as many shows as possible. Thank you again to the Super Chatters. Thank you for all of you for logging on for this short show. I will talk to you all soon.